Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Bennick. Our show today is part of a two-part series on something that we'll all get to vote on in November, and that's the state constitutional amendment to prohibit the imposition of a state income tax here in New Hampshire. The show that you're watching right now is the one in which support for the constitutional amendment will be presented. Now, you may notice that this show is longer than the other show in this two-part series in which opposition to the constitutional amendment was presented by Jeff McGlinch of the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute. Please don't construe that as my showing favoritism to one organization over another or as an endorsement of one side of the debate over the other. Um, Mr. McLynch did have time constraints that we needed to accommodate um, and had absolutely no problem knowing that this particular show would be a little bit longer than his. So I, I did want you to understand that. So first of all, let me give you a quick background on the proposed constitutional um, amendment. In January of 2011, the constitutional amendment to prohibit a state income tax was introduced in the New Hampshire House of Representatives by five representatives and three senators. And it was known as CACR 13. And it was approved just about a year later, in January of this past, this year, in fact, uh, by a vote of 257 to 101. And then in this May of 2012, the New Hampshire Senate approved an amended version by a vote of 20 to 4. This version is what will appear on the November ballot. Um, our previous show, and, and please do note this depending on the order of, you, uh, of which you watch the shows, the previous show you'll hear us refer to question two on the ballot. However, some things change quickly when it comes to state government. And in between taping of the two shows, we learned that it is not now question two, but instead will be question one. Um, so you will see all of this as question one. Now, my guest on the support side of the constitutional amendment Today is the New Hampshire State Director of Americans for Prosperity, Corey Lewandowski. And Americans for Prosperity is a grassroots movement with over 2 million members in 50 different states. And they advocate and promote limited government, lower taxes, and more freedom. It was founded in 2004 and is funded by the contributions of over 90,000 American people. Members work at every level of government, from local to federal, um, to advocate for public policies that will cut taxes and government spending in order to halt the whole encroachment of government and the economic lives of citizens. Uh, advocates fight proposed tax increases. They point out evidence of waste, fraud, and abuse. And they advocate to remove unnecessary barriers to entrepreneurship and opportunity by sparking citizen involvement uh, very early in the regulatory process in an effort to really cut down on all that onerous red tape that everybody has to deal with. They also advocate to restore fairness to our judicial system. Here in New Hampshire, there are 29,000 American for Prosperity members. Um, the AFP did play a major role in the 2010 Republican takeover of U.S. Congress, and it's actually considered one of the most powerful conservative organizations in the country. Corey Lewandowski serves as the state director here in New Hampshire and serves as the advocate for those over 29,000 members. Um, and again, he works at every level of government. Prior to this position, he served as ex executive director of the New England Seafood Producers Association, and that's the organization that represents the vast New England seafood industry. And for two years prior to that, he served as a top staff member to New Hampshire's former U.S. Senator Robert C. Smith. And while there, not only did he run the senator's re-election campaign, but among other things, he oversaw a $4.2 million operating budget. Now, previous to that, Corey served as the legislative political director of the Northeast region for the Republican National Committee, 
So a wealth of experience there. And he also served as administrative assistant and chief political strategist to Republican Congressman Robert Ney of Ohio um, for three different sessions of Congress, the 105th, 106th, and 107th. Um, he served as executive assistant and director of intern programs to Republican Congressman Peter G. Torkelson of Massachusetts. And uh, Corey graduated from the 205th 48th class of the New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Council. And for four years, he actually served as a certified police officer with the New Hampshire Department of Safety. He's also a licensed real estate agent and a notary. So you can see that he brings a whole bunch of different perspectives to his job and, and to his work for Americans for Prosperity. He received his bachelor's in political science from UMass, his master's in political science from American University in Washington, D.C., and he also attended the Naval War College. So quite an impressive background. Corey, I know you travel constantly, so I am so pleased you're here. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you for it. coming. Absolutely. And uh, I know that you have a lot to say about this constitutional amendment that we're all looking to vote on. Um, so we do know that CACR 12 will now appear on the ballot as question one. How exactly, if passed, will it serve to prevent us from having legislators impose a personal income tax on the people in New Hampshire. How, how does that work? Well, let's just take a step back and understand okay. how something of this magnitude gets onto the ballot in the first place. Okay. Because ultimately, the voters are the ones who should decide if they want to make a significant change to our state's constitution. So as, as you indicated in the opening, the legislature has an obligation to pass a constitutional amendment by 60% in each of the House and the Senate before it's even brought before the voters. So at any time through the legislative process, if the residents of our state want to come forward and ask their elected officials not to move that bill forward, mm -hmm. they could have done that. The Republican-controlled legislature in the last two years moved CACR 13 forward, and what it said was, do we want to permanently change the state of New Hampshire's constitution so that ultimately our state will never have an income tax? The first two steps have been accomplished. Unlike a regular piece of legislation where it is a simple majority to pass this bill, mm -hmm. uh, a constitutional amendment requires 60% of each of the bodies, so both the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. And unlike a regular piece of legislation, the governor would normally have an opportunity to weigh in, either veto mm -hmm. or sign the bill or let it become law without his signature. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in this scenario. Okay. This bill goes directly to the voters now. And once it appears on the ballot, which it will, and as you indicated, it will be question one on the ballot. Mm -hmm. The voters now have to approve this, again, not by a simple majority, but by two-thirds of the people who are present and voting need to vote in the affirmative. In other words, to implement this in order to then ultimately change our state constitution. So the, the highest bar possible is required when we're talking about changing the state constitution because this isn't something that we should do lightly. And so there's been a lot of effort put into making sure that uh, legally the language has been uh, reviewed appropriately. Mm -hmm. The legislatures, uh, both the House and the Senate, have gone and, and moved this bill forward. And now it's going to give the residents of our state the opportunity to decide if they think it's important to change the Constitution in New Hampshire, which is done very rarely, so that we remain a free state without ever really implementing an income tax. So that's the process just in and of itself. So there are multiple hurdles to cross. And uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that we're in a presidential election cycle. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a high voter turnout. We should. And yeah. this voter turnout is going to really dictate if we're going to be able to change the Constitution. I think uh, at the core, New Hampshire residents believe in smaller government. You know, we have always prided ourselves of having no sales tax, no income tax, no broad-based tax. You know, Governor Shaheen had supported that. Uh, Governor Lynch has supported that. Governor Benson and, and Governor Sununu and, you know, all of the preceding governors, starting with Governor Mel Thompson back in the late 70s, they said no broad-based tax. That's what differentiates New Hampshire from the other surrounding states. Mm -hmm. So when the voters have the opportunity to go to the polls, we're going to ask them to say, yes, no income tax is the answer. No income tax, vote yes on one. So that's the very first step. And it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, and it's about education, and it's about giving people, which I think is the right thing, the opportunity to decide 
if they want to keep more of their money mm -hmm. or if they want to let the state take over more of the money. And you know, if we look at history, uh, we've seen many states across the country who haven't had an income tax in the past, a personal income tax. And what they've said was, you know, the argument, and, and obviously I don't know what your other guests have said, but they're going to say, we're going to lower your property taxes. You put an income tax in place, we're going to lower your property taxes. Well, history doesn't bear that out. And the last state to implement an income tax was the state of Connecticut, 21 years ago. 21 years was ago. Was it that long ago? It was 21 years ago. Wow. And, this, and the, the elected leaders down there said, here's what we're going to do. You residents have a, have a very high tax burden as it relates to your personal property mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. By implementing an income tax, what we're going to do is we're going to lower your property tax rate. <laughs> You're going to get some relief. And geez, that sounds great. You know where we are today, 21 years later? 21 years later, uh, since the passing of the income tax in Connecticut, they have the third highest personal income tax in the country. They do. The state wow. of Connecticut does. And they have the fourth highest property taxes in the country. Really? So they've gone from just what was uh, just a high income, t high, high property tax to now having both a high income and a high property tax. And so, you know, the notion that your property taxes are going to be, uh, continue to escalate if we don't change this and implement, implement an income tax is a fallacy. You know, property taxes are controlled for the most part at the local level mm -hmm. and predominantly through the schools. Mm -hmm. You know, I live in the town of Winham. It's a beautiful community. I'm very proud to raise my family there. 80% of our tax dollars go to the school budget. Mm -hmm. So we pay sure. in our town $23.08 per thousand on your home. You know, implementing an income tax will not reduce the burden that we have to pay to educate our children, to make sure that they have the best education possible, to make sure they have all the tools necessary to compete in a global marketplace. What it will do is simply add another level of bureaucracy. And I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of time in Concord. And until the last two years have happened, uh, I have yet to see a legislature, Republican or Democrat controlled, that has said, we don't want any more of your tax money. Mm. You give them that money, mm -hmm. they find a way to spend yes, it. And I will. think we've They'll got to control that. Now, if, say for instance, uh, you know, the proponents of an income tax who, and you're absolutely right, they always do tell us that we'll lower our property taxes. But just let's go to the, you know, the far end of the scenario that they would succeed in, in defeating this constitutional amendment and ultimately putting forth a, a state income tax that became part of our lives. Wouldn't that also create the need for yet a new government agency to administer that and collect that money and set up all the rules and all that good well, stuff? It, it really comes down to uh, the Department of Revenue Administration, mm -hmm. which is kind of our version of the IRS in the state mm -hmm. that collects all the revenue mm -hmm. um, to then go out and burden themselves with collecting additional revenue. Now, mm -hmm. I can tell you, I don't work for the DRA, but they like to collect revenue. That's what mm -hmm. these guys do. Right. So they like to go out and find ways to collect more of your money. Uh, and every time we have seen the legislature make recommendations to reduce revenues, and particularly the limited liability corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was part of the fight a few years ago with our chairman Tom Thompson to reduce the the burden on LLCs in our state. Mm -hmm. You know, DRA, the Department of Revenue, uh, and the commissioners came up and said the state can't afford it. You know, we can't afford to keep cutting taxes. Well, what we saw in the four years preceding this legislative session. When the Democrats were in control, mm -hmm. there were 100 taxes and fees raised. Uh, everything from you know, uh, cars to businesses to real estate taxes mm -hmm. and fees, court taxes and fees, uh, tobacco, health and human services, fishing, boating, you know, rooms and meals, mm -hmm. you name it. There was not enough money that the legislature could get their hands on. And so our state had grown to the point where we became unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And the new legislature came in and said, you know what, we're going to reverse engineer this problem. Just like you and I have to do every time we sit down and write our checks at the right. end of the week. How much money am I making? That dictates how much money I spend. And I think that's a good source for the state to do the same. They've always done it the other way. They've said, how much revenue do we have? Mm -hmm. How much do we want to spend? Let's go collect that mm -hmm. revenue. This legislature mm -hmm. has right. said, hey, how much revenue do we have? Let's reduce our spending. And what we've seen in this legislature in the last two years, they reduced spending by 11 percent. They were at 11 point, uh, they went from 11.2 billion to 10.2 billion dollars in annual, in biannual spending. 
Now, is there more room to cut? There is more room to cut. Mm -hmm. And, you know, did the state stop functioning? It didn't. Did it require the state to become more efficient, to use technology, to stop the duplicative processes? It does. And I think just like we would require any small business that wants to be successful. If you're a small business owner, you know what? You don't have six people doing payroll for one person, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you streamline the process. You make sure you're using the best technology. You're using resources available to you and to your business that the state should be using. And uh, I think the notion of $10 billion is enough over a two-year budget, I think that makes a lot of sense. And what this potential constitutional amendment would do is to severely limit future legislatures from going and implementing an income tax. Mm -hmm. Now, they could do it. They could do this in the same process which we have followed to this point, which is both the House and the Senate could pass a new piece of legislation that says we want to change the Constitution again, should this pass, mm -hmm. and we want to put an income tax back on the ballot. And then, again, it would be up to the voters. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate recourse in our democracy, is the voters get to decide. I know the guys in Concord want to have all the power, but it's up to the voters to decide. And I think that's the right thing to do. So, you know, what this would do is say, we're going to take a pot of money off the table. That doesn't prevent them from raising taxes and fees and all those other things which legislatures have done. The business profits tax or the business enterprise mm -hmm. tax, they can still do all those things. But we're saying we hold the sanctity of not having an income tax in our state so important that we're going to modify our state constitution so that if the legislature decides in their infinite wisdom four years down the road they need more revenue, they have to go back to the people and ask for that money. And I think the people will ultimately reject them. I, I agree. And, you know, you mentioned before that in, in one of the recent sessions over 100 different new taxes and, and such were passed. And this uh, a, a candidate that I had interviewed earlier today shocked me, quite frankly, when he said that in New Hampshire right now, we have over 400 taxes. Now, some of them are called fees, and some of them are called assessments, and some of them are called fines, but no matter how you cut the cake, you know, it's still a piece of cake. It's still a tax. Well, it, and, and, I mean, seriously, knowing that that's out there, I, I guess I'll show my bias here because I, I can't imagine really why people would think an income tax now should be added to our, our existing burden. Well, there was an opportunity in this legislature which uh, they couldn't accomplish. There was a bill called CACR6, which was mm -hmm. a constitutional amendment, uh, which did not secure enough support uh, to make it to the ballot in November. Now, and what would that one have done? What that would have done is it was a very clear piece of legislation. It would have taken party politics out of raising taxes or fees. Okay. And what it said was, if the state legislature wants to raise taxes and fees on anything which the state controls, they now need a super majority in order to do that. Ah. doesn't say they can't do it, All right. but it's not 50% plus All right. one vote anymore. It's now a super majority. There are 13 states across the country that have this legislation, including states like California. It is probably the single reason why California as a state has not ultimately declared bankruptcy. Because in order to continue to raise taxes and fees on people, mm -hmm. even if you're in the majority, even if you've got 52 percent or 53 or 54 or 55 percent, it's not enough on a straight party line vote anymore. It really requires bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's what holds people accountable. So if you want to, if the legislature decided that they want to go raise taxes and fees, they would have had to have done so with 60 or 66 percent of the entire body present in voting in order to do that. Now, the legislature couldn't get that bill passed and put onto the ballot, but I think it's something they're going to revisit because we're one term away from a new legislature coming in mm -hmm. and saying, you know what, we want more money. Just like we saw six years ago mm -hmm. and then four years ago, they said, we're going to raise 100 new taxes and fees. And guess what? When you go to register your car or you go get an inspection, mm -hmm. it's going to cost you more money. And that is the power that the legislature has. I would love to see our state have supermajority legislation so that if they want to implement those taxes and fees, whether it's a fishing license fee mm -hmm. or a whatever fee or regulation they have, they need a supermajority to do it, and that really helps control spending. And it would also require them to be a lot more transparent to us, to the public, That's in right. terms of justifying what it, what it is that they're 
doing. Well, you know what happens is in the legislature, I think what happens a lot of times is they leave these fees on the books. Mm -hmm. And they may reduce it down to zero, but they don't they don't pass a bill mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get rid of the bill. Yeah, yeah. Because the door is always open it's to always, revise so it again. So all you've yeah. got to do now is just make a minor change, a, a yeah. procedural change to the bill, and the business profits tax could go up a quarter of a percent or a half a percent. Mm -hmm. If you eliminate that business enterprise tax, completely mm -hmm. eliminate it, mm -hmm. you now need to have a person who's willing to sponsor a bill to bring that fee back. That takes a lot of guts to do, and I'll tell you, elected officials don't traditionally like to sponsor taxes now. There are some <laughs> exceptions to that. This is true. And we've seen one of them as a candidate for governor who is proud to have sponsored uh, a tax on the regional greenhouse gas initiative uh, called Reggie or on your electric bill and and she was very clear in now her that debate was last Maggie week. Maggie Hassan? Maggie Hassan okay. said, I am proud to have sponsored a tax on your electric bills. Oh, I did hear that in the debate. New Hampshire yeah. has the second highest electric rates in the country and she is proud that she sponsored a tax to increase your electric bills. I fundamentally disagree with that. I, I believe that you can spend your money better than the state can, mm -hmm. better than the the local government can, better than your municipal government can, better than the county government can. It's your money. That's mm -hmm. what people tend to forget. It's your money. Yeah, you're and, right. And sometimes yeah. people say, geez, I'm so happy they gave me a break. They cut my taxes. <laughs> Let me give you a break. It's just your money. <laughs> yeah. You need to fight for it. So <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And and I think we've all, you know, developed that mindset simply because of what we've been told. That's right. And and maybe we did accept it too easily. Well, it, and it may be, but you know, statistics will tell you this. As you look at um, income tax specifically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2000 to 2010, the last 10 years when it was available, the 10 states in our country which don't have a personal income tax, as opposed to the 10 states which have the highest personal income tax, they did a comparison. 135% mm -hmm. uh, faster personal income growth in the states without a personal income tax. 445% more new jobs in those states, 152% faster economic growth, and 299% faster population growth in the states without a personal income tax. And if you think about the personal income tax, just, just for a second, which New Hampshire doesn't have, but has an ability to permanently ban, mm -hmm. people who have the financial resources vote with their feet. Yeah. And so if you have the choice to live in a great state like New Hampshire, where there's no mm -hmm. income tax and no sales tax, or a state like Florida where you get great weather mm -hmm. and no income tax. Or you can move to Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. right? You've got a huge income tax there. What do people do? We see an increase. You know, We've seen a, a big decrease in Massachusetts state population to the point where they have lost one of their members of Congress mm -hmm. because they no longer have the population commensurate with 10 members of Congress to represent them. They're now going to have nine because of reapportionment. We've seen Florida continue to grow. We've seen Texas, a very pro-business state, mm -hmm. continue to grow. We've seen California lose millions of people. 3.6 million people have moved out of California in the last 10 years, partially because of the financial crisis. Um, partially because the individuals who have vast sums of wealth, who can choose where they want to live, say, I don't want to live in California anymore. I'll move to Nevada that doesn't have an income tax. Mm -hmm. Or I'll move to Florida that doesn't have an income tax. And so people vote with their feet. And when you see that, you see states that are gaining in population, states that are losing in population. And the states that have the highest amount of income tax and taxes across the board are losing population to those states that are in warmer climates, that have a better uh, economy for businesses, uh, a right to work states, have no income taxes. And the people who have the resources say, I'm gonna go where I can keep more of my money. And it just makes a whole bunch of sense. Well, it's funny you brought that up because I, I've had that conversation with people myself, you know, just an informal conversation with friends. You know, you're sitting around talking about things. And I'm, I'm a native of Massachusetts. And to be honest with you, I've, I've not met a ton of people in Bedford. I mean, there are people who have lived here all their lives. But I would say the majority of people that I've met in Bedford came from somewhere else, whether it was nearby like Massachusetts or, you know, they were company transplants um, from all over the country, a retired military, of which we have quite a few. And I mean, to my way of thinking, I would think that a lot of folks pick New Hampshire. At least one of the reasons would be the fact that there's not a state income tax. Now, you know, all things being equal, um, I'm very happy living in New Hampshire. I, I like Bedford a lot. Um, but moving here did mean that I gave up some things that were 
part of my life that, that were amenities, or I considered to be amenities, um, that were services that I knew that I wouldn't have here. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, some of them may sound simple. Um, I did not have to either hire somebody to come and haul our garbage away every week or load up the back of the car to go to the town transfer station when I lived in Massachusetts. That's right. um, the stuff went right out on the curb and rain, hail, sleet, or snow. Mm -hmm. It went away in a truck. Um, I did not have to worry about septic systems or wells or anything like that. I turned on the faucet, I had water, and the water went away when it was used. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of things. I, I had street lights, I had sidewalks. Um, you know, again, kind of things that in a lot of places in New Hampshire, in a, most of Bedford, we don't have. So if I now had to spend the same amount of money to live in New Hampshire as it cost me to live in Massachusetts, would I think about going back to Massachusetts where I did have more amenities, where I would be closer to the city of Boston, which my husband and I love, mm -hmm. and all that a city like that offers, sports, culture, entertainment, and so on? Yeah, I think we'd seriously consider it. And, and I think a lot of people would. And you know, you just kind of said that that's been borne out in other states. So how come that doesn't seem to be part of the dialogue here for the people who would advocate that we need a state income tax? If you go back and look at the large employees in our state, mm -hmm. whether it's BAE Systems, right. or it's PC Connection in Merrimack, mm -hmm. uh, the Anheuser-Busch factory, mm -hmm. they're recruiting from a pool of people from across the country. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I can assure you these major corporations are saying is, come to New Hampshire, mm -hmm. you're gonna make more money. You know, dollar for dollar, you're gonna make more money mm -hmm. because you don't have to pay an income tax. And what we have seen, uh, and the candidates for governor have talked about this, is we are the second biggest commuting state in the country. Because yeah. people commute from New yeah. Hampshire because they wanna live here, the quality of yeah. life, and they drive down to Boston and Massachusetts yeah. for those higher paying jobs. What will happen unequivocally is if you implement an income tax here in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. People say exactly what you've said is, I love my quality of life here. Mm -hmm. um, and I've chosen to live, I live on a private road, which mm -hmm. means me and my neighbors plow our road, not mm -hmm. the town. Mm -hmm. There you go. But it also means that when I want to go into town, when I want to walk into town hall, mm -hmm. I don't have a 400 person line in front of me. Right. And the town clerk actually knows who I am. Right. And there's a personal service. And that's the type of community that we have in Windham mm -hmm. about 13,000 people. And you really get to know your neighbors. You know, to go and implement an income tax, and now we're paying the same taxes and fees as if mm -hmm. I were gonna have my trash picked up and sidewalks mm -hmm. and a street plow go by mm -hmm. and say, geez, you know what? I might think about living down in Massachusetts. Um, a big part of you know the money that we spend is for our children. Mm -hmm. You know, and I and I we do that voluntarily in our community. You know, we chose that community because of the school system, because of the ability to educate the kids and give them everything that they have. However, when you get to start to compare the two, uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, mm -hmm. unequivocally, you can make more money if you want to work in Massachusetts. Sure you can. Right now. Yeah. But as soon, you know, and, and that's why the burden of potentially putting an income tax on the residents of New Hampshire will detract from bringing good, high-paying professionals to New Hampshire for the, the high-paying jobs at BAE System. So I say, geez, guys, I can make as much, if not more, if I want to go down and live in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and work at Raytheon or commute into Boston every day and fight mm -hmm. that traffic, mm -hmm. um, we're really going to hamper our ability to get those high paying jobs and attract new businesses here. Mm -hmm. Because a big selling point for New Hampshire has been and continues to be no sales or income taxes. They just opened up the, uh, you know, the outlets in Merrimack. I mm -hmm. can tell you because my wife loves the place. <laughs> uh, you know, they've also, you know, it, it is just a big difference when you say to your friends, I don't have to pay an income tax. Mm -hmm. I pay my federal taxes, right. but my state doesn't charge me, and I'm happy to go to the dump. I, I like to go to the dump, to be honest with you. Um, Chit chat. Right, you hang out, <laughs> it's, a, it's a social place to go. You don't have that in Massachusetts, and being part of that well, smaller community. Well, some towns do. 
Some Overall, do. most don't. But, but the big yeah. ones don't, yeah. you know? No, and, not the big uh, ones. You know, I grew up in Massachusetts, like many others, in a town called Lowell, right over the line. Oh, I grew up in Lawrence. So, yeah, so, yeah. you know, 100,000 people. You know, why don't we understand each other, well, huh? Yeah, we were drinking the same Merrimack River that's water That's exactly for right. Sakes. And uh, probably a body in there somewhere along the line. But <laughs> uh, Yes, actually, every so often right? they would pull one out, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's a sense of community here. I think, uh, I think for the first time in a long time, this legislature in Concord understands that giving people more of their money mm -hmm. means that they're going to spend more of their money. Mm -hmm. And if they can't spend it, it's because they're taking care of their family. Mm -hmm. And that's really the priority. We have to remember it is not the state's obligation to take care of people. That's not what they're set up for. Mm -hmm. right. It is the state to say, right. everybody has a safety net if it's necessary. Let's give you the tools so you can be prosperous on your own. Everyone has an equal opportunity to work hard and go out and try and make a good living. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean everyone's going to have a good living, mm -hmm. but you've got those same opportunities there. And that's really what the state is all about. And, you know, as we were talking about the potential for people moving even back to Massachusetts, if that's where they came from, or settling in Massachusetts, even if they've never lived there. I mean, truth be told, I mean, people like to kind of portray Massachusetts as all brick and sidewalks and everything. But as you well know, and I well know, there are some absolutely gorgeous towns with wonderful school systems. Um, so it's not like you'd be giving up that particular quality of life, you know, leaving New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, if somebody is in that long commute every day, they'd be getting back a little more of their life and saving money from the commute, because no matter how you cut it, commuting is expensive. And, and look, New Hampshire is not just competing with Massachusetts and Vermont and Maine to our borders. No. You know, we're competing for businesses uh, in a global economy. You know, That's we right. know that. We That's need right. to do a better job at the state level of attracting top tier businesses like Boeing Corporation mm -hmm. and Caterpillar mm -hmm. and those big manufacturers. We've got an exceptionally educated workforce here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We've got the skills and diversity necessary to do any job. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen the retooling of the plants up north from the old paper mills to, to you know, more productive companies up there. And, and people are willing to work hard. We have an, a work ethic here in New Hampshire that is unmatched by anybody else. Mm -hmm. We just need the opportunity to have those jobs here. And making New Hampshire a right to work state and ensuring that we don't, we permanently ban an income tax in our state attracts those big businesses who says, geez, if I'm a CEO and I make $100,000 a year running a company, do I want to give up 6% of that income to live in Massachusetts? Or would I rather keep that extra 6% sure. of my salary and live here sure. in New Hampshire? And that's a big difference when you start to get to that you know, level of income. Sure it is. Now, let me ask you this. Why this year? It is this, I mean, because, this, you know, obviously this whole idea of a tax has floated around and mm -hmm. we've had candidates for governor and everything else um, not take the, the pledge and, and such. Um, I've been hearing about it as long as I've lived here. Why this year are we seeing it on the ballot? Would, do you think that there was an urgency, that the legislature recognized an urgency to, to get this in front of the people once and for all for a vote? I think it's a fundamental difference between the legislature over six years ago to where the legislature is today. Okay. And it is truly, I believe, and I, I wouldn't want to speak for the elected officials because I am not one, right. but I've talked to a lot of them, and they firmly believe that the people should decide. Mm -hmm. the, the people who are in power right now in Concord think that the process works by letting the voters decide. Mm -hmm. And if the voters speak and say, you know what, we can't pass this by two-thirds, which is what's required on the ballot, mm -hmm. and we may want to have an income tax in the future, then the voters have spoken. But we have not had the opportunity in the past, through both houses of the legislature, to have such a like-minded notion on this, to even let the voters decide. So I think it is really a true difference of saying the people should decide which taxes and fees the state has, and make it more difficult for the legislature. The legislature, for the first time in a long time, is rescinding their power and giving it back to the voters where it belongs. Mm -hmm. You know, they've said, the legislature, as I said, trying to put on the ballot the opportunity for a uh, supermajority legislation. That would have given the voters more influence. Mm -hmm. okay. This gives the voters more influence in the process. And if the voters stand up and say, we don't want to change a constitution because that's too difficult to do, I think the legislature will say, we respect what you have, sp what you have said, and we'll move forward and we won't have to do it again. I mean, this is not an easy task. We've got a presidential campaign which is exceptionally close in the state of New Hampshire. 
I mean, we are a battleground right. state. We have seen Joe Biden here recently, and right. Barack Obama, and Mitt Romney, and Paul Ryan, and, right. and all of the surrogates are here, uh, trying to make the case for them. I think voter turnout is going to be exceptionally high on both sides, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, liberals. Um, it's really about saying, even, even the average person, if you explain to them, you don't have an income tax today, but in a year from now or two years from now, you may have to pay two, three, four percent more. Mm -hmm. When we're already, we've gone from $1.84 a gallon at the pumps to three eighty-four a gallon, up over a hundred percent in a four-year yeah. window. Scary. That's the stuff that hurts the average. I mean, the, the CEO who's making that big six-figure check, yeah. he probably doesn't notice that two dollar a gallon yeah. difference. Or if he does, it doesn't have as much impact. The person who's just getting by, sure does. When they say, Absolutely. ten dollars, I used to be able to yeah. fill my tank, and now it's twenty, and I don't yeah. have that extra twenty. You say to them, you've got the opportunity to make sure that you don't have to pay more out of your paycheck every week or every two weeks. I think they step forward and say, I can spend my money better than you can. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard some people, and, and I know you have as well, <coughs> excuse me, in fact, uh, there was a gubernatorial candidate that sat in that very chair and said that uh, bribe-based tax is the most equitable method of taxation. What do you say to that? Here's what I think. I think if that were true, we would need to revamp the entire tax structure, which I wouldn't be opposed to doing. Okay. You know, there are loopholes all over the place. Mm -hmm. We hear about the millionaire loopholes, the billionaire loopholes. You know, this guy paid 2% of his annual taxes when the average worker who goes to work every day, mm -hmm. who pays his taxes before he gets paid or mm -hmm. she gets paid. Mm -hmm. That's how it works in, when you're an employee. So you don't get the luxury of being uh, the CEO of a corporation that says, I'm going to hold back and not pay my taxes because I'm going to take a percentage of the earnings of the company. Mm -hmm. The average worker pays his federal income tax before he gets his paycheck because yes. it's deducted immediately. Yes. Or self-employment tax. It's, it's painful. So this notion that a broad-based tax is the most equitable, equitable starts that way. And what they say is, well, everybody pays an equal amount. But that's not the case because mm -hmm. you still have the difference between people who make their money from what is income, mm -hmm. and then you have people who make their money from investments, and those are taxed differently as well. And I Good think point. that what we have, honestly, is those people who are getting their paycheck every week or every other week, who go and put in 40 good hours uh, of work for a, a full week's pay, you know, like many of us do as employees of corporations uh, and companies, say, geez, you're gonna make a bigger broad-based tax on me? You know, I'm saving now to go buy a new used car and I've got to pay more for that car, or I've got to pay more for a sales tax. I don't think, you know, what we're doing is disincentivizing people from going out and spending their money with these broad-based taxes. I, I got a real problem with it, to be honest with you. Let the people decide where they want to spend their money. And if they really want to spend money on a broad-based tax, drive right over the national border, mm -hmm. right? Go down to Massachusetts <laughs> if you want to do your shopping. You'll pay their sales tax, and you can feel good about yourself. But let's look at it. Let's just be honest for a second. How many people from our state drive south of the border mm -hmm. to go buy their liquor or their cigarettes uh, no. or or anything or no. major purchases. No. You know, if you want to go and buy a nice piece of furniture which is exceptionally expensive, does anyone say, geez, I really want to go down to Jordan's in Danvers? Or do they say, I'm going to go to Jordan's in Nashua? Well, I guess there's some little hook on delivery well, or something. Well, that's true yeah. if you're getting it delivered yeah. here. But look, if I'm going to yeah. go down with my pickup truck and I'm going to buy a piece of furniture, am I going to drive all the way down to Danvers yeah, and pay exactly. the sales tax? Exactly. Or, or do we think the, the, the converse is true? Do we think the people from Massachusetts, we watch their, their license plates come across the border every yep. day. They we stop do. at our liquor stores. They buy our gasoline. Yep. They buy our, our cigarettes. And not only are they buying those things because the taxes are less, but when they walk into those convenience stores on the border, mm -hmm. you know, they're not just buying one item. They're buying 10 items. Mm -hmm. They're getting out of their cars, and they're going inside, and they're stimulating those businesses. And those businesses are small businesses. My neighbor in Windham owns one. Mm -hmm. He'll tell you every time a person comes in to buy a lottery ticket, they spend $10 in addition to that lottery ticket. That's Coca-Cola off the shelf or beer or snacks or whatever it may be. That is where the money that those small businesses need and survive on. And you know what? You, don't, you just don't see the opposite. You know, and many of us will say, geez, I've got to drive to Massachusetts. I'm going to get my fuel before I leave the house because mm -hmm. I don't want to get stuck down there <laughs> paying more. And that's just the truth. Yeah, right. It doesn't happen the other way. So no one says, boy, I really hope they... All right, let me rephrase. Very few people say, boy, I hope they put an income tax in so I can pay more money out of my paycheck every two weeks or every week. Uh, maybe there are some people that say that. You know what I say? It's like those people down in Massachusetts. 
you have the opportunity to pay more in your taxes mm -hmm. when you're a resident of the state of Massachusetts. There's a little special box they got down there that says, if you want to pay higher taxes, mm -hmm. check this box. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of people, particularly liberals, will tell you, we need to fund more programs. But when they get the opportunity to pay their tax rate a little higher, mm -hmm. you know, Elizabeth Warren, uh, John Kerry, mm -hmm. the millionaires yes. and billionaires, they, they say, well, that's good for everybody else, but I'm not going to pay that Didn't online. Didn't John Kerry get in a little bit of trouble a couple of years ago when his very multi-million dollar yacht, he got caught uh, having it registered in Rhode Island rather than Massachusetts he, to be the tax? He, he didn't want to pay the tax <laughs> on uh, what was obligated to the state. Yes, that's correct. And so what he said, Didn't and he I'm say later he forgot or something? Well, you know, he said, well, you know, it's not really my boat. It's the Heinz <laughs> Corporation's boat. But, I mean, again, you've got, Whatever. you have people in, in that example, you know, John Kerry's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, yes, he and he his, his family. And they're doing everything possible to avoid paying more taxes yes. while at the same time asking you, mm -hmm. a person who can't avoid registering your car, can't avoid paying your mm -hmm. Social Security tax and your federal income tax, before you get your pay, mm -hmm. they're asking you to pay more so they can pay less. I don't think it's right. Uh, I don't think it's fair to ask people to say, geez, why don't you go pay more out of your income so the state can spend more of your money on bloated projects and bloated uh, things and letting people retire when they're 45 years old with 20 years in the system at 80% of their pay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a problem. We've got to look at that. Uh, geez, I would love to have the opportunity to say I started in state government at 20. I'm 45 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm an able-bodied person, but I've done my time. I'm going to get my 50% pension <laughs> plus my health care, yeah. and I'm going to ask you to pay for it for the next 40 years that I'm alive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem. Uh, I don't think we need more taxes in our state. No, I think we, we can we have keep cutting. Taxes. And uh, and I'm I hope that if this if the uh, legislature gets back in and looks at the problems that our state is faced with, and we have a governor who steps in and shows some leadership on the budget, mm -hmm. um, they work together and come up with the notion that ten billion is enough. I mean that's that's five billion a year. Mm -hmm. That's plenty to run our mm -hmm. state. And on top of that, you know this notion that if it's in the yellow pages. The state shouldn't be doing it. Makes a whole bunch of sense. You know, why we do, why does the state do services, which I can open up the yellow pages and, and have someone, again, I have a private contract to plow my driveway mm -hmm. and my road. Why is the state in the business of plowing roads? Why are we paying town and state employees to do these things when we can subcontract some of these services out and save on the health costs? Because those are the big factors. Save on the overtime, save on the maintenance of all these pieces of equipment. You know, oh yeah, pension and benefit packages that's are, are huge costs. Well, yeah. Once, if this state were to implement an income tax, we will go by the exact way that the state of Connecticut has, and in 21 years from now, uh, Connecticut will be saying to, to New Hampshire, "I told you so, guys," and we'll have the third highest property taxes in the country, the fourth highest as a percentage of their median income, you know, the second highest property tax bill on average in the country as a percentage of their total salary. I mean, do the residents really need that? Because it always sounds good. Yeah. We're going to lower your property yeah. taxes. But at the end of the day, it's not going to happen because spending will continue to escalate. And I'll tell you, here's a great thing that I think the state could do to change the way that we spend our money at the local level. Let's change the way that people get their tax bills. We get our tax bill now in December, mm -hmm. right before Christmas. Yep. And everybody complains through December and January and February and town meeting comes up in March. Yep. And they forget what they paid in their tax bill. You send people their tax bill at the end of February, right before two weeks town before meeting. town meeting, I'll tell you what, when the town comes before and they say, it's only $6 million more, it's only $3 million more, people have that tax bill fresh in their hand. And I think in some cases they'd be standing out in the parking lot with pitchforks in their hands. I think that's right. And I'll tell you, if the state were to, to really want to rein in spending at the local level, you change it so you get your tax bill in March and September or February and August, mm -hmm. right before that town meeting, mm -hmm. you can't find a room big enough in any town to hold the residents who are getting their tax bill saying, why did my tax bill go up another $1,000 a mm -hmm. year mm -hmm. or another $800 a year? I mean, that's real money and tell me what we're getting. Yes, it, it is. Tell me what we're getting for that service. And I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll start controlling spending at the local level as well. And, you know, I really don't know that, that legislators, all of them, or, or at least some of them, 
and some politicians really do recognize the importance of that you know, New Hampshire advantage, um, whether it be, you know, the lack of the sales tax, the lack of an income tax or whatever. And I mean, just to kind of point to that, and, and this is a little, you know, this is more related to a sales tax than an income tax, but sales tax is broad based. Mm -hmm. um, some years back, I was um, an executive director of a chamber of commerce. Mm -hmm in Massachusetts, in central Massachusetts. Now, as we all know, what's a chamber of commerce? It's a coalition of businesses and industry in, in a given area or a given uh, geographic region. And talk to any business person, and, and especially in a chamber that is kind of community or regionally based, and the mantra for the most part will be to encourage people to do business within their community or region so that the local businesses will prosper, correct? That's right, of course. And it all sounds good, and people, I think, try to do that, but sometimes they don't. And now here was the Chamber of Commerce, which was supposed to be representing all of the businesses in that region, and it was a regional chamber. We represented, I don't know, eight or nine cities and towns. Actually, I think it was 10 cities and towns. And in those 10 cities and towns, there was no shortage of businesses like office supply mm -hmm. businesses. Yet long before I came on board with that chamber, a decision was made that all office supplies and equipment and such, whether it be new phones or computers or whatever, would be purchased at Staples in Nashua so that there would not have to be a sales tax paid. And there was actually a board member assigned who would drop up to Nashua once or twice a month to buy the supplies. And of course, I had to give him a list of all of the various office supplies that would be needed. So here's a business organization choosing to take business away from their own members to save a buck for the organization by shopping in New Hampshire. Do you think our legislators are like totally getting this, how important that advantage is to the state? Yeah, I, I, I think they do. And you know, we see stories like this all the time. There was one not that long ago that Howie Carr from the Boston Herald pointed out. And Howie Carr manages to point out a lot of things. He, he's great, I gotta be honest. But you know, he pointed <laughs> out a story. I, I have, yeah. He's just a hot once. ticket, he's, isn't he? He's great. Yeah. <laughs> but if, it was, uh, if you remember, they were raising um, a tax on alcohol down in Massachusetts. Yes, yes, And yes. one of their esteemed elected officials drove over the New Hampshire, <laughs> o over the border, pulled up to the New Hampshire liquor store with his House of Representative yep. license plate and had that. a full carriage full of alcohol yep. that he was purchasing in our state. And yep. believe me, we appreciate his business, but it is just that type of uh, understanding that, look, what's good for you isn't necessarily good for me. And mm -hmm. this is where the state is always so wrong. You know, we're gonna tell you what's best for you, but don't worry, when it comes to me, I know what's best mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And so we see this time and again in your example, in that elected official's example who said, mm -hmm. look, I think you should pay more for your alcohol because mm -hmm. I'm going to New Hampshire anyways. We appreciate the business. Um, if we implement an income tax in our state, it is, a, it is going to be a tax which will never get off the books it will continue to grow. We know it will, it will never get off it, the books. It will, it will take some elected official with a simple majority yeah. to go from 2%, yeah. well, we just need to squeak out a little bit more, let's make it 3%. Now, you know, three is okay, but if we if we went to four, mm -hmm. we could really change things really in our state. Things. And it would go to yeah. four. And then in a year after that, they'd say, well, four is okay, but if we went to 5%, look at the revenue stream we could have. Mm -hmm. And they think it's their money is what happens. And that's what will happen. And I can tell you, if we were to implement an income tax here in our state, uh, we would see it at probably 5% in the next 20 years. And then be looking at it and say, well, five's a good number, but mass is six and a quarter. So we can get ours to six and we're still a quarter percent below what they are. Because that's the mentality of elected officials. Uh, in totality, they think that your money is their money mm -hmm. and their money is their money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, let's just prevent them from getting a hold of more of your money. Let's stop them and say, look, enough is enough. And let's ban the income tax, permanently change it. And you know what, then let's start fighting about what our property taxes are. At $23.08 per thousand in my town of Winham, it's an egregious amount of money. Let's go back and start reeling in the cost. And again, 
I'm proud to say we've got a good school system in our community. But does that mean that 80% of our tax money should go to the schools? You know, what are we delivering? What is the metric by which we're measuring where that money's going? You know, they've built a new high school in my town. They built a new kindergarten in the town. They're now saying they need another new school. They can't, you know, they can't tell you if we're going to have 10 kids in the school in 10 years or 50 kids in the school in 10 years. They don't know. There's no long-term trajectory. Now, your town's um, not built out yet either, is it? We're getting close. I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's getting yeah. close, and we're, we, you know, we're a commuter town. You yeah, know, Wyndham's you on the border, yeah. and, and yeah. like Bedford, you know, a lot of people travel down yeah. into Massachusetts yeah. for those higher-paying jobs. Um, Probably more of an instance in your town because you're so much closer. That's right. To the we're, I mean, we're six yeah. miles over the border. Yeah, I know. So right, right past Salem. But I'll tell you, when our residents go shopping, they go over to Salem. They go to the Rockingham Mall. Oh, sure they do. They go over to yeah. you know the Pheasant Lane Mall. And yeah. what? Think about this just intuitively. Why was the Pheasant Lane Mall, all of the stores? built in New Hampshire and the parking lot built in Massachusetts. <laughs> I know. That, we didn't do that I the know. opposite way. We didn't say, boy, let's put all our stores in Mass so we yeah, can, yeah. you know, let's park for free, but we'll pay right, that sales right. tax. Because they knew, even both states knew, build that it, people would not go there if you yeah. had to pay the Mass tax. And so... The, well, look at 28 in Salem. I mean, that's the, right. the entire road is gridlocked all the time. And that's it's exactly all Massachusetts right. plates because it's everybody, everybody who lives around up. there knows enough to get around it. That's exactly on right. back roads. Everybody comes up there. They want to shop at Rockingham. Yeah. You know, they want to shop at all the stores on yeah. 28 because yeah. they know that for driving the extra three minutes over the line, yep. they can save money. And that's what we should encourage here. That's what the New Hampshire Advantage is all about. It's always been about you having more control over what to do with your money. I don't see we, why we'd ever want to give that up. You know, it's it's interesting because obviously the the people who, the organizations and such that didn't want to see this on the ballot uh, are obviously opposing it now and, and trying to convince people to vote against it. And one of the arguments, and I'm, I'm not giving away, you know, the secrets of another interview or anything because both organizations are all organizations that are, that are into the debate have been very open in their positions. Um, but one of the, the arguments, obviously, is that to pass this is to tie the hands of future legislators or, you know, to create a situation that we may someday live to regret that will be passed on to our, our children and grandchildren. Yet you had said that even with a constitutional amendment, I mean, if need be, if, if there was an overwhelming reason for it, it could indeed get changed again, correct? Well, the two things. We can always go back and, and change a law. Right. Uh, you know, the elected officials can and bring it back before the voters and they can change it and they've done it, right. of course. Uh, the other thing is, by banning the income tax, that does nothing about all of the other taxes and fees which are right. already on the books. So by taking this off the table, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. does not take off the hundreds of other taxes which mm -hmm. are on the book. So, mm -hmm. you know, the legislature still has in their purview to raise your car registration fee mm -hmm. or your gas tax or all those other things or, or your, your tobacco tax or your alcohol or whatever it may be. They can raise all of those taxes and fees. And we saw a legislature that raised 100 taxes and fees in a four-year period. And the question was... I, I still can't get over that every time I hear that. Was the state... Since shivers up my back. Was the state more prosperous? And no. the answer is no. no. The answer is no. And so the question now is, by returning more money to the people, you know, when I went and registered my car in uh, June, I was so fortunate because that's when the new legislature had come in and they passed their car, the reduction in car registration fee. Mm -hmm. If I would have waited uh, and got it done early, mm -hmm. I would have had to pay a higher fee. But then the, the new uh, uh, fiscal year came into being mm -hmm. and I actually got a, a little bit of a deduction, a little bit of a reduction in my registration for the car. Same is true with boats and, you know, all kinds of a myriad of things across the board that this legislature said, let's reduce the costs. Mm -hmm. and you know what we saw? More people registered their boats in the last two years than had in the four years before that. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because, you know, maybe it was only a $5 increase. Maybe it was a $6 increase. Well, it's 5 or $6 more on top of the cost of fuel for my vessel, true, which is exceptionally expensive. Yeah, and so... Yeah. You know, what we see is the totality of the taxes. So banning an income tax doesn't preclude the legislature from raising taxes and fees on you in a myriad of other ways. I wish the legislature had passed that CACR6, which said if we're going to raise our tax or a fee, you've got to do so <coughs> with a supermajority. <coughs> that would have really put a hold on spending. Now, they may come back and look at that again in the next biannual session. I don't know and bring that before the voters, which I think is great. 
Yeah, there'd be no restriction, would there, for that being filed in no, 2013? No, that's right. They could go back and do that again okay. and say, you know what, we, we want to raise the car registration fee because we really need the revenue. If that's mm -hmm. what the elected officials want to do, they'd have to take a vote on the floor. Mm -hmm. They couldn't rely on 50%. They'd have to go and work it, work mm -hmm. hard mm -hmm. to get 60 or 65% or 66% of those elected officials present and voting. And, you know, it's... It's a tough thing to do, not only in the House, but in the Senate, mm -hmm. to get that much of a majority to agree to anything. Mm -hmm. So let's just make it more difficult for them to take more of our money. I think it's a reasonable thing to ask. I, I can't really debate you on that. I, so again, I guess I'm not being objective because, um, frankly, I think we pay enough to government and I'm not always convinced that government spends our money well. I, I think you can spend your money better. You know, the empirical evidence has shown that over the last 10 years, the states with the highest personal income tax are losing population to states with either the lowest or no personal income tax. People are voting with their feet. They don't want to be taxed more than they need to be. And so, you know, we've seen 4.2 million individuals move out of the states with the 10 highest income taxes uh, as a percentage of personal income, while at the same time, 2.8 million Americans have moved into the states, the 10, high, the 10 states with the lowest tax burdens. On average, every day, 1,265 individuals leave those states with the high taxes and move to the states with lower taxes, or nearly one per minute. Those states have to be doing something right. You know, it's not all about just you're a great warm climate mm -hmm. because winter's coming here, mm -hmm. right? We don't yeah, have a warm climate. It was cold yeah. this morning. It's been cold. Yeah. But people Frost want on the to come to New Hampshire. To people want to come here. Yeah. We've got natural beauty. We've got an educated workforce. We've mm -hmm. got opportunity for people. It's in, by and large, a safe, great place to live. Uh, no income tax, no sales tax. You know, when I talk to my colleagues across the country, they say, how do you live in a state that has no sales tax and no income tax? What's it like? I say, it's phenomenal. Please don't learn any more about it because we don't want you to take our population. So, you know, Alaska and New Hampshire are the only two states in the country that don't have a personal income tax and a sales tax. It's amazing. And there are variations to that. Some I states, did not know that. Some states don't have personal income taxes. Right. Some states don't have right. sales taxes. Alaska and New Hampshire, two amazing states with natural beauty. Uh, it's so nice to know that we have an opportunity to change our constitution so that we will continue to stay competitive here in New Hampshire and make sure that we're attracting good businesses big businesses and creating good high paying jobs here so that we don't have to become the second most commuted out of state for work. We want to be the second most commuted into state for work and let people live here uh, without paying their income tax, without having an income tax and additional burden on them. Very compelling information. We are just about out of time. So I will leave this to you before I close out the show. And I thank you so much for coming because you had a wealth of information. Just so people won't be confused when they go to the polls in November, what question and how should they vote if they agree with what they heard here today? When you go to the polls in November, it's going to be real easy. Uh, the slogan is simple. No income tax, yes on one. So if you believe you can spend your money better than the state can, if you believe you know what's best for you and your family better than state, local, or municipal governments, then, stay, then say, yes, I want to ban an income tax permanently here in our state. No income tax, yes on one. It's a simple message everyone should understand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for having coming. me. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And now we'll all find out what happens in just a couple more weeks. We'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, um, I think you probably learned a lot in this show today. Um, and I think Corey has it, it kind of really expanded the whole issue in terms of yes or no for state income tax. He's told you a lot of the ramifications of such. He's told you the pitfalls and he's told you the promises made elsewhere that didn't quite work out. So he told it like it is. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to go to vote. And until next time, you tell it like it is, I will too. Bye-bye.